The severe undulating erosion upon the walls of the Sphinx enclosure undoubtedly showed that the Sphinx had been heavily weathered long before the Sahara became a desert. Therefore, one must suspect that it could indeed be over 9,000 years old. Not knowing exactly how much rainfall there's been in the distant past, the Sphinx could indeed be far older than this. The most notable scholarly advocates, Robert Scotch, argues that the Sphinx may be far older than 12,000 years. Robert Baval and Graham Hancock proposed that the Sphinx may have been built around 10,500 BC, during the last age of Leo. Anthony West believes everything on the Giza Plateau testifies to an advanced, secure, and long-settled civilization. Therefore, he suggests that the Sphinx may have been built not during the age of Leo, but a whole processional cycle earlier, in around 36,000 BC, a date he feels is more in keeping with the history of Egypt as chronicled by certain Egypt kings. Regardless of an exact date, all of these talented Egyptologists propose a date set much further back within history than currently accepted, and they have provided considerable evidence to back up such conclusions. At the time of disclosure, the argument sent shockwaves through the Egyptologist establishment, not because of the datings. Egyptologists and mainstream historians have grown quite inept at ignoring data, but more because it was realized that there is, indeed, no other explanation for their arguments. There is little doubt that the Sphinx enclosure was subject to severe erosion within its lifetime, and although it could have been explained away as a naturally formed enclosure, we fortunately know from analysis that the limestone blocks dug out from there were then used within the building of nearby Sphinx Temple. Interestingly, no other site in Egypt shows the same type or degree of erosion. Was the evidence hidden away, concealed from the public in what could only be called a conspiracy? Sediments surrounding the base of the monuments and a once existing watermark upon the stones halfway up the Great Pyramid's sides indicate just that. Two-inch thick salt incrustations once found within inner chambers Silt sediments rising to 14 feet around the bases of the pyramids found to contain seashells and fossils that have been radiocarbon dated at nearly 12,000 years old have indeed slowly vanished over the years. These sediments could only have been deposited in such great quantities by major sea flooding. A watermark was also once clearly visible on the limestone casing stones of the Great Pyramid. These stones were unfortunately unknowingly removed by invading Arabs. These watermarks were halfway up the sides of the pyramid, or about 400 feet above the present level of the Nile River, 200 feet above the base. It seems the last remaining shred of evidence, the enclosure, survived due to the talented individuals that were required to spot it. Individuals who are thankfully on our side. There are many ancient mysteries still to be unraveled within ancient Egypt, and although they are rarely academically shared, the basalt floor found upon the Giza Plateau, being one such feature, located at the base of the Great Pyramids, possess some of the most compelling fragments of ancient advanced machinery anywhere on Earth, let alone Egypt. Additionally, there does indeed exist other areas upon the Giza Plateau that also exhibit these unquestionably compelling fingerprints left by an as yet not understood ancient advanced technology. One such place, known as Abu Ghraib, is a place that many alternative researchers assert could have once been some sort of ancient stargate. Originally built as a sun temple, constructed to represent the ritually vivifying power of the sun god Ra, it was one of six temples built upon the site, however only two have been identified, Yuzerkov and that of Nayusera. At the base of the site, at the western end, an enormous obelisk has also been unearthed, which, according to experts, symbolized the resting place of the sun god Ra. The obelisk's base is a pedestal, with sloping sides and a square top. It is approximately 20 meters high and is constructed of red granite and limestone. Estimates of the combined height of the obelisk and base vary, although a number of independent researchers believe when the structure was built, 
the total height of the obelisk was most likely somewhere between 50 and 70 meters in height, an enormous height and indeed weight for any of the currently attested ancient Egyptian builders to have worked with. But what we find the most intriguing regarding this obelisk, and indeed ancient site, linking back to the advanced anomalies located upon the basalt floor, is the enigmatic drill holes found driven straight through the heart of this monolith and many of the other large granite stones which still litter the site, the holes undoubtedly completed using some form of high-rotation power tool. Clear, compelling evidence that whoever created this ancient work had access to astonishingly advanced technologies. Additionally, the site is also home to a number of enormous red granite blocks, each weighing in at several tons. Curiously, these massive blocks also exhibit the same uncanny precision cuts and extremely well-polished surfaces which are also found throughout ancient Egypt and the quarries thereof. All once mounted into position with such incredible precision. Many investigators have concluded after visiting the site, just like the conclusions one is left with after exploring ancient Baalbek, that whoever laid these massive stones into position had an extraordinary technological prowess. Why does modern academia continue to deny such truths in favor of such mundane and incomplete testimonies as to the true origins and builders of ancient Egypt? How can we continue to be expected to believe, in the face of such compelling, overwhelming evidences, that these sites were merely the work of our more modern copper-wielding ancestors? It is undoubtedly highly compelling. What's behind the Sphinx's ear? Hidden in plain sight for many a millennia, there is clearly a blocking stone still in place. A blocking stone we would never have noticed if it weren't for a rather unusual source of information. Recently, we covered the amazing story of Kipri Yanovich Boriska, the extraordinarily intelligent boy from Russia that from a young age has supposedly been able to remember a past life, a life as a pilot upon the once flourishing planet Mars, destroyed during a catastrophic war. What is extraordinary regarding this claim, however, is the remarkable information that Boriska has somehow been able to share from a very young age, information which has taken astronomers many years to realize. According to Boriska, Life on Earth will change irrevocably when the Great Sphinx is unlocked, using a mysterious mechanism behind one of its ears. Unfortunately, he has not given any further details about what exactly the opening of the Sphinx will do, though this was enough for us to notice the anomaly resting upon this very ancient monument. Boriska has unfortunately since disappeared. However, while in the public eye, he claimed that he was a reincarnated soldier, placed here upon Earth to avert the same destructive fate as Mars, claiming that many of his kind exist upon the Earth, calling them indigo children, often stating all of this while in a trance. Which is highly compelling, as he is not the only one who once prophesied very similar astonishing developments that would, one day, arise surrounding the Great Sphinx. Edgar Case, an American Christian mystic, would often answer questions on subjects such as healing, reincarnation, wars, Atlantis, and future events also while in a trance. Was Case also an indigo child? Graham Hancock is another figure who has publicly claimed that there are many mysteries still left to be unraveled surrounding the Sphinx, specifically that a time capsule is hidden within the Sphinx, a capsule that we will only discover as a species once we are intellectually capable of absorbing its message. When it was shared within the mainstream media recently that an enormous cavity had indeed been quietly discovered within the Great Pyramid of Khufu, the largest of the Great Pyramids, the only one with tunnels constructed within its inside, and additionally, the only one which is, in fact, eight-sided. The reaction by the Egyptian Antiquities Authorities was very revealing of their attitude towards secrets being revealed to the public. 
Not only were the claims made from reliable sources, but they are also backed up by extensive research projects, and indeed, its resulting evidential data. However, this has not deterred Professor Zawi Hawass from publicly denying any such cavity's very existence, shrugging off all claims and accompanying research as, quote, lies and hearsay. With such enormous hurdles in place, prepared to stifle any such discoveries from going public, it is inevitably going to be an uphill battle to expose the truth regarding the Great Sphinx of Giza. During the reign of King Tut between 1333 BC and 1324 BC, the understanding of iron metallurgy or indeed the casting of such objects was very limited. Iron smelting is the extraction of usable metal from oxidized iron ores. It is vastly more difficult than smelting tin and copper. Such metals could be cold worked in simple pottery kilns and then cast into molds, a process largely accepted as being present within ancient Egyptian times. However, the smelting of iron requires hot working and can only be melted in specially designed extremely heated furnaces. It is therefore not surprising that humans only mastered iron smelting after several millennia of the Bronze Age. However, there is a pair of relics found within ancient Egypt whose sheer existence disprove the officially held chronological account of when these hardened metals were developed. Or do they? Within the ancient wrappings of the sarcophagus, which contained Pharaoh Tutankhamun, two daggers were discovered. Encased in gold sheaths, they were placed there more than 3,000 years prior. One had an iron blade, and the other with a blade made of hardened gold. Yet both are not made from regular metals. Amazingly, these daggers are in fact made from metals not native to Earth. It is officially accepted that it would have been quite difficult nigh impossible for ancient civilizations to have acquired iron in pure states. So most of the pure iron found in weaponry within this mysterious culture are academically accepted as coming from, quote, meteoric sources. This explanation may be easier to digest for the majority of population of Earth. However, it is not only a flawed explanation, but illogical. If this ancient Egyptian civilization, which possessed knowledge we are yet to rediscover, did indeed extract these alien metals from meteorites, yet largely accepted to have not been able to cast such metals, then an obvious question arises. How did they cast the metal into daggers? The official explanation offered provides no answer, as is often the case with out-of-place artifacts. A more logical scenario is that these daggers were in fact the remnants of a far older civilization a civilization responsible for the construction of ancient Egypt. A group of people visited by, or indeed traveled to, people from another world entirely. Additionally, modern advanced metallurgical analysis found that the iron dagger is not a normal meteoritic iron, but a complex, intelligent, and very strong alloy containing various amounts of nickel, chromium, and cobalt. Furthermore, the nickel content is so high, nearly 25%, it makes this alloy totally different from those made by man. The alchemy required to make such a non-rusting metal was developed many centuries, if not millennia, after King Tut's death. Just where did these daggers come from? How old could they actually be? Were they made as a gift by a race who visited Earth? Apart from our postulations, it seems no one can produce a working theory. Arce, the American Research Center in Egypt. Arce's website states as follows. Among Arce's many great achievements is our relationship with the Supreme Council of Antiquities, the SCA, within the Egyptian Ministry of Culture, without whom our work would not be possible. Arce is viewed as making important contributions that serve to help Egypt directly in its pursuit of cultural heritage preservation. What this statement confesses to is the implication and more than likely collaboration with Egyptian authorities to cover up the real truth about ancient Egypt. In 1992, German robotics engineer Rudolf Gantenbrick was exploring shafts within the Queen's Chamber at the Great Pyramid, using a crawler robot he had designed himself. 
His intentions were to install an air conditioning system within the pyramid's existing design. While exploring these ancient tunnels, he discovered one of the shafts was blocked by a tiny limestone blocking door, a secret doorway only accessible with the use of robotic technology. Rudolf Gantenbrick, who was able to map, explore, and analyze the shafts for many years, believed a second door would have suggested the possibility that there would be yet another 40 centimeters further away. His hypothesis, based on the knowledge that many ancient Egyptian funerary monuments were equipped with a series of three blocking doors placed close to each other in succession before the entrance to a sacred tomb. In 2002, the National Geographic Society discovered this second door. Using their own robot known as Pyramid Rover, this event, closely supervised by Arce, who subsequently pulled the plug on the whole operation regarding the shafts. The team had a simple solution to Gantenbrick's problem. They sent the robot along the shaft, gripping the walls instead of the ceiling and floor. In this manner, it was somehow able to ride over the top of the obstacles. The rover's journey along the northern shaft revealed yet another door, just as Gantenbrick's claimed. Mysterious hieroglyphs, written on the floor of the hidden tunnels within Egypt's Great Pyramid, were shown to the world in an initial report on the robot's discoveries, published within the Du Service Day Antiquities. The images revealed features that had not been seen by human eyes since the construction of the monument. Researchers from around the world were particularly intrigued by three red ochre figures painted upon the tunnel's end deep inside the pyramid. Books such as Giza the Truth by Chris Harold and Ian Lawton, The Stargate Conspiracy by Lynn Picknett and Clive Prince, and Secret Chamber by Robert Balvel have all, thanks to the tremendous and diligent research accomplished within, shed light upon the controversy surrounding the Giza Plateau and the Secret Chamber's existence. The key question, the theme witnessed throughout these studies, was whether information has been withheld, discoveries undisclosed, and an understanding of the pyramids and sphinx existence purposefully kept hidden from the world. On the 22nd of March, 1993, Dr. Zawi Hawass was suspended from his position as chief inspector of the Giza Pyramid Plateau. It seems Gantenbrick took an opportunity, while the powers that be were distracted, to announce his findings to the world press in early April. It would appear, after substantial digging, that the string pullers within Egypt originate out of America and are stationed within Egypt in the form of Arce. The truth regarding what is buried beneath these ancient structures may still remain a mystery, but realizing the obstacles obstructing an understanding of this truth is half the battle won. An announcement that seemingly slipped us by was made recently within Egypt. This announcement pertaining to an amazing discovery made within an area of the Giza Plateau that for a number of decades has been conveniently shut off from the public. Although the location is claimed to be a military training base, archaeologists have apparently been secretly beavering away within this remote slice of antiquity. Announced by the Supreme Council of Egyptian Antiquities, Egyptian authorities have apparently found the mysterious traces of the legendary Fourth Lost Pyramid of the Plateau. This provocative announcement stirred up a gale of protest among many Egyptologists, and the reason for this may be because the discovery might turn out to be highly controversial. Although the pyramid is in a very bad state, and this may be due to its immense age, with only a few rows of blocks remain, and these surviving blocks clearly displaying evidence to indicate that the missing blocks have simply eroded away over the eons. This ruin may not be the most important find in the area, or indeed, the purpose for the video. Along with these pyramidal remains at the site is another amazing anomaly. In the middle of this mysterious desert, an enormous staircase has been found, plunging into the desert floor. Seemingly excavated before this announcement and left for those who were fortunate enough to get access to the area to rediscover and photograph. This enormous staircase plunges straight through a limestone basin many meters in depth. This surgical slice 
has revealed an astonishing implication. It has revealed that the Giza Plateau does indeed extend this far. Not only that, but it demonstrates the sheer, unimaginable cubic size of this area of stone. A block of stone that was apparently man-made. Where this staircase actually leads to is as yet unknown, although it is thought to drop far below that which is currently visible, and preliminary scans of the area are suggesting that it plunges through the plateau deep into an ocean of groundwater below. By examining the pictures of the discovery, it appears that the site has indeed been excavated from the sand, having most likely been submerged from view beforehand. The question is, who did these excavations? Who built this unbelievable structure, or indeed, the mind-bogglingly enormous Giza Plateau? Who built the pyramids and sphinx upon it? Where did such an enormous stone plateau come from? How did they shape and carve such mysterious structures with such blocks? Or perhaps, most importantly of all, where does this staircase lead? Did whoever undertake this excavation task manage to discover where it led? More research and exploration will undoubtedly be undertaken over the next few years. We will, of course, keep you posted. Ancient building techniques are an excellent subject to explore if one wishes to understand just how advanced our hidden ancestors were. Additionally, it allows one to get a true insight into the contradictions currently upheld by academic institutes the world over. There still exists an extraordinarily diverse array of building techniques. Some, interestingly, appear to overlap even older advanced methods. For example, a stone boring technology, seemingly used upon many ancient monuments, in many cases it appears to have been deliberately used to slightly damage these ancient stones, leaving them etched with uncanny marks, possibly in an attempt to also leave their mark to prove their past existence, later to be realized by us, now laying within their very distant future. We feel that these marks, along with many other aspects of these ancient sites, indicates that many ancient civilizations have been and gone here upon our Earth. Ancient metal clamps used to seat enormous stones, precision machine-cut blocks, some left within quarries, clearly indicating machine manipulation, impossible block building, effortlessly fitting random-sized blocks perfectly together. Yet the most enigmatic of these ancient building features, which many suspect was indeed somehow connected to the construction of said sites, has to be the protuberances. Rarely mentioned within history books, yet these protuberances are present on many of the most ancient of block structures, which can be found all over the world. No one seems to know what these protuberances were placed upon these structures for. The biggest of these, undoubtedly carved into the still in situ megaliths at Yangshan Quarry, a feature we have previously noted and pondered over. Not only do these enigmatic notches suggest a past, world-going, highly advanced civilization having once prospered here upon our planet, but a feature known as the Boss Mark, found deep within the Great Pyramid of Khufu, may link, for the first time, the builders of the Great Pyramids to ancient structures found elsewhere on Earth. Furthermore, the methods used by the pyramid builders are, interestingly, the same methods used by builders of the other sites containing protuberances. This strategic building method, meaning that their ruins have outlived, we feel, many other ancient civilizations now lost to history. Their capability to move such mind-bogglingly huge stone blocks and their ability to create such erosion-resistant structures, indicate to us that the builders of these sites may have lived an unimaginably long time ago, and probably chose to create such earth-shifting structures in a bid to indeed survive the eons. Were they doing so in an attempt to leave their legacy on our planet? Or maybe they were, and are, still trying to tell us something. Only time will tell. 
We have long stated that there is considerable evidence to suggest that not only the Great Sphinx, but also its accompanying pyramids found dotting the plateau are far older than currently attested. We have shared the premise that many of the ancient hieroglyphs found all over Egypt are a mere 4,000 years old, while the pyramids and the Sphinx, both conveniently absent any of these same illustrative writings, are far older than this age. Why are there no hieroglyphs within the Great Pyramids? Additionally, why were there never any steps or stairs built into such awkward of structures? Is this a clue to the past function of the Great Pyramids? Were they never intended to be entered by humans? Not only is this absence of Egyptian art a compelling clue, but it also indicates that these structures were not constructed by the same people. If indeed they were constructed by the same people, why did they never document this task? There, in fact, exists an artifact within Giza. Once quoted as a must-see artifact by Zechariah Sitchin, this inconspicuous stone, known as the Inventory Stella, amazingly, is an authentic inventory left by King Khufu. It not only supports most of what we have now come to suspect regarding the plateau, a theory concluded from many different avenues of research, but it is a written description of the Egyptian civilization's activities upon the plateau, including what happened to the Sphinx, or more accurately, Anubis. We have come to suspect that many of the most popular alternative researchers who have spent their careers researching these specific subjects have, just like academia, ignored patently evident materials surrounding the ancient past. Giza's Inventory Stella Zachariah Sitchin wrote in his book Journeys to the Mythical Past that the stella was irrefutable proof, provided by Khufu himself, that he did not build the Great Pyramid, and that the Pyramid and Sphinx were already there in his time. Predictably, the stella is simply ignored. However, some, like James H. Breasted, commendably included the inventory stella in his official list of 4th Dynasty artifacts, stating that, regardless of opinion, that it, quote, bore all the marks of authenticity. Also, the French Egyptologist Gaston Maspero, whose most famous book, The Dawn of Civilization, stated that the stella was indeed a factual record of the life and deeds of Khufu. Regarding the Sphinx, the text states that lightning once struck the head, destroying a large portion. Khufu then recarved the head into what we see today. He then built his temple in the vicinity of the House of the Sphinx and, interestingly, renovated the Great Pyramid. The Stella Inventory not only confirms many things we have already come to suspect took place within Giza, but additionally, this mounting evidence is indicating to us that other, suspiciously popular, supposed in-depth investigations, often accompanied by expensive trips to said sites, are deliberately inaccurate works of controlled opposition. Regardless of other opinions regarding this matter, we will continue to present what we always have on this channel. Truth and honest opinions. As always, thanks for watching. During the past few years, we have covered many aspects of Mankuri, Khafra, and Khufu, the three great pyramids of Giza. We have explored numerous amazing facts regarding these structures, which have remained secret for many years. As the interest has grown regarding these three amazing structures, more people with suspicions, hypothesis, and technical and intellectual talents are fortunately beginning to approach these mysterious and wonderful structures in more explorative ways. We are experiencing the beginning of an ancient Egyptian renaissance thanks to the gift of modern technology. At the beginning of this year, an international team of researchers began investigating the buildings from afar, gazing at them with unusual cameras. Using state-of-the-art infrared heat detection technology, they have discovered some surprising anomalies regarding the heat signatures visible on their faces. What these thermal anomalies reveal are undiscovered shafts, more than likely leading to additional and undiscovered secret tombs deep within these amazing pyramids. The thermal scanning that they have successfully completed has revealed that there are many of these temperature fluctuations, 
in many areas undocumented as containing anomalies. Thus, what the team has done is pinpoint unexplored shafts dotted across the pyramids. The team also found a particularly impressive anomalous signature located on the eastern side of the Khufu Pyramid, very close to ground level. From the beginning, the team had always maintained that they would publicly disclose their findings. All of the staggering finds were made public by Antiquities Minister Mamdu El Damati. During a press briefing, quote, There is something like a small passage in the ground that you can see, leading up to the pyramid's ground, reaching an area with a different temperature. What will be behind it? said El Damati. The scanning was done throughout a 24-hour period, allowing the researchers to monitor subtle temperature changes as the pyramids heated up and then cooled down during the day and night. Though the huge granite and limestone blocks which make up most of the pyramid, this technology was capable of recognizing the slight differentials in their temperature. By monitoring the speed of this heating and cooling, thanks to these miraculous cameras, the researchers were able to isolate several persistent anomalies. Thus, they may have just unlocked more of the pyramid's secrets in one day using state-of-the-art technology than Egyptian antiquities or archaeologists worldwide have in more than 100 years. While the difference in temperature between most adjacent limestone blocks was between 0.1 to 0.5 degrees Celsius, the largest of heat anomalies discovered on and within the Great Pyramid was an impressive 6 degrees warmer than the surrounding bricks. So far, there are plenty of theories being put forward as to what these heat anomalies might indicate. Not surprisingly, with the leading assumptions being that of just empty areas, a hypothesis I'm sure some would like to make a reality. The good news is that the study, which is called Operation Scan Pyramids, will continue. Next, the researchers intend to use cosmic particles called radiographic muons to create a 3D reconstruction of the pyramids of Giza in an attempt to map all the secret chambers and passageways within the pyramids. We will keep you posted on their future finds. There are many mysteries to be found within ancient Egypt. Unexplained, seemingly impossible mysteries, which litter the caverns, tunnels, flooded underground layers, and indeed, the once inaccessible passageways, only recently explored using advanced modern technology. However, some of the most perplexing mysteries lay in plain sight. Not only the Great Pyramids themselves, an obvious enigma for academia to explain the construction of, but many anomalous features which can be found within objects often leaving academics baffled as to an explanation. The Cheops sarcophagus being one such anomaly. Although these pyramids are entered and explored by millions of people every year, and indeed, this mysterious sarcophagus shown to many of these inquisitive explorers. What many the funded academic tour guide often leaves absent from their explanation of this supposed tomb is how exactly it arrived at its current location. As we have explored and exposed previously, the casing stones that can be found on many of the pyramids are to us not only indicative of another phase of construction work once having been undertaken upon these structures. But due to the erosion present and the different styles featured, are in fact indicative of more than one attempt to conserve these marvelous structures for future generations. Thus, one must conclude by more than one now extinct advanced civilization. As such, the age of the sarcophagus of Cheops could be immense. So it is not surprising that it has encountered not only grave robbers, but has been vandalized also at points within the distant past. Furthermore, and perhaps most intriguing and frustrating, is that the sarcophagus lid is missing, a lid that could have explained the past contents of this mysterious box. Or like the tomb of Pakal, exposed extremely controversial illustrations of possible past technologies. Unfortunately, however, or rather most conveniently for academics, this lid has never been discovered. Yet what is most perplexing regarding this diorite box, notably one of the hardest workable stones on Earth, is that no one seems to know how the original builders managed to transport the box to its current location deep within the bowels of Cheops. 
The diameter of this supposed tomb, being too large to have traveled down any of the known tunnels, which have so far been discovered within the ancient pyramid. This leaves us with two likely possibilities. One, that the diorite box was placed there and the pyramid built around it, which is a mysterious and confusing hypothesis, mostly due to the lack of markings of significance found upon the sarcophagus or indeed the lack of any dedicative markings found anywhere else surrounding it. It is as though the box was placed there without much effort to indicate any importance to his existence. Yet, to cut such a box, which has since been discovered to have been cast from one single block of diorite, would have taken tremendous effort, a feat that modern man would only accomplish with the use of diamond-edged power tools, not to mention the effort that would have been involved in moving this multi-ton stone into its found location. The second hypothesis regarding how this sarcophagus found its way into its current location is that the box itself was transported to its found location through tunnels and passageways we are yet to discover, possibly hinting at the fact that within this great pyramid, there are indeed many more hidden layers and cavities we are yet to explore or discover. Maybe the placement of this seemingly inanimate box was placed there to suggest exactly this. Furthermore, what was on the lid of this supposed sarcophagus? Why is it known as the sarcophagus of Khufu, when Khufu was not discovered within it? In fact, nothing was discovered within it. And why is the lid mysteriously absent? Where did the lid to this sarcophagus go? Why, if destroyed by grave robbers, was it not left where it lay? Did this lid contain controversial information? possibly pertaining to the original contents or indeed purpose of the Great Pyramids? We find the diorite sarcophagus of Khufu, and indeed its unexplainable journey into the center of the pyramid, highly compelling. When we first explore the suppressed yet very real secret passageways littering the Sphinx base and structure, we were confronted with compelling evidence to suggest another Sphinx existed on the other side of the African continent in Zinder. Not only were there still existing remnants of this once spectacular structure, but there also remains the clearly recognizable and notoriously erosion-resistant accompanying pyramids. However, what some may find astonishing is that exactly 6,000 kilometers to the east, in a place known as Baluchistan, Pakistan, another sphinx can also be found, clearly of a similar antiquity. Supporting the suspicion claimed many times on our channel that a civilization which far preceded the ancient Egyptians actually built these amazing pyramids. Known as the Sphinx of Baluchistan, many funded academics have strongly denied the possibility of this familiar-looking formation being of man-made origin, and many attempt to claim that its familiar shape, along with the surrounding environment's artificial appearance, is mere coincidental and that the entire area is just a natural formation. These conclusions, made with no official archaeological investigations ever being undertaken at the site. Thankfully, however, an equal number of individuals who have actually visited this site, most self-funded, have actually concluded the complete opposite. Graham Hancock being but one individual who has concluded that the site is indeed a very ancient sphinx quite possibly dating back to the last precision of Leo, some 12,500 years ago. As Graham's website put it, quote, The Sphinx appears to be decked up in a headdress that closely resembles the Nemus headdress of the Egyptian pharaoh. The Nemus headdress is a striped headcloth that covers the crown and the back of the head. It has two large conspicuous flaps which hang down behind the ears and in front of the shoulders. The Sphinx has horizontal groove across its forehead, which corresponds to the pharaonic headband that holds the Nemus headdress in place. One can easily make out the contours of the reclining forelegs of the Sphinx, which terminate in very well-defined paws. It is difficult to see how nature could have carved out a statue that resembles a well-known mythological animal to such an astonishingly accurate degree." End quote. We find it disappointing 
Yet not surprising that many individuals within modern academia, accredited with many titles to their name and thus much educational responsibility, would defend a paradigm regardless of investigative support, a highly unprofessional yet repeated practice across many fields. The Sphinx is perceived by nearly all concerned as a symbol of protection, a guarding force which was often erected at sacred or highly important sites. And the Sphinx of Baluchistan is no different, appearing to be guarding a temple-like structure nearby. Many have concluded that the Baluchistan Sphinx temple site actually retains clear evidence of pillars, a temple entrance, an elevated sculpted structure to the left of the entrance, along with much more interesting geology in the surrounding area. Is the Baluchistan really just a natural formation? If so, why has no official investigation been undertaken? It is clearly a very controversial archaeological site, and one we find highly compelling. The Queen's Chamber, which lays within the Great Pyramid of Khufu, more commonly known as Cheops, has astonished, shocked, and mystified Egyptologists since its mysterious existence was discovered. The intrigue into this elusive chamber, along with its mysterious adjacent shafts, comes as no surprise once one understands the anomalous characteristics of their construction. As we have already covered before, massive cover-ups have been suspected as taking place surrounding this mysterious chamber since its discovery. Strange shaft tunnels, set at a 45-degree incline, no larger than 20 centimeters in diameter, run away from this room, and no one seems to know why. Not only would these ancient shafts require being hermetically sealed during the pyramid's construction to stop them from becoming blocked, but the excruciating effort that would have gone into making them becomes all the more of a confusing undertaking once you realize they were not even connected to the chamber, but hidden 40 centimeters away from entering the tomb within the walls, completely invisible from the inside of the burial room located deep within the structure. Cheops, noticeably being the only pyramid to have ever been constructed with such shafts, making their addition a popular mystery within Egyptian history. One leads out from the subterranean chamber, two lead out from a termination point some 40 centimeters from the wall of the so-called Queen's Chamber, or now popularly suspected to be that of an alien tomb among ancient alien specialists, and two from the King's Chamber above. Here is where our story becomes interesting. Rudolf Gantenbrick, famous for actually discovering the blocking door within one of the Queen's Chamber shafts, which could lead to an as yet undisclosed tomb, has also made other curious discoveries within the Great Pyramid. Discoveries which could only be explained by modern covert explorations of tunnels that were supposedly to that point unexplored. Gantenbrick's cache being but one example of these mysterious finds, deep within the tunnel systems in the royal chamber, at a 90-degree turn going vertically upwards, a pile of papers, possibly wrapped artifacts, weighed down with a small piece of timber or stone, possibly another artifact, was discovered by Gantenbrick's robot. Also, during initial location attempts to find access tunnels leading to the Queen's Chamber, several blocking stones required removal. After the removal of the seventh block, a modern-era hexagonal steel rods were discovered discarded upon the tunnel's floor. Each section of the hexagonal steel rods measures 2.7 meters in length and was fitted with a round socket, which allowed them to be joined to the next section. In one of the lower shafts in 1872, Wayneman Dixon found three more objects, which could be considered proof of prior covert exploration of the mysterious northern shafts. A copper grappling hook, about 5 centimeters in length, accompanied by a small gray-green stone ball and a broken-off piece of a square wooden slat or rod, about 13 centimeters long, the wood would today be the most intriguing of his finds. These artifacts suspected to be remnants of the grave robber's tools, could have been carbon dated, yet this fragment is the only one of the three to now be missing out of the London Museum's collection. 
Unfortunately, in his writings, Dixon doesn't say in which of the two lower shafts he actually found the objects, but he mentions them in connection with a northern one. Not only did these obviously highly intelligent people leave evidence of how they must have gotten in, but also traces upon the previous untouched ancient walls of the shafts within Cheops, clearly left by their previous robotic technologies. Other square metal rods have been recovered, along with other artifacts discarded within some tunnel systems deep within the ancient structures. Meaning these guys got to the treasures way before we did. Interestingly, reported evidence of covert excavations continues to this day, heavy-duty electrical supplies discreetly running into and trailing deep into the pyramids have been noticed and photographed by some of the more astute tourists. Witnesses to the sounds of heavy machinery being used beneath the site is also frequently reported, yet rarely followed up. It seems it's not a question of whether brilliant minds have achieved the seemingly impossible in penetrating these secret layers, but more a question of how and what astonishing finds have possibly been kept concealed. In the first wing of the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, close to the Room of the Mummies, one cannot help but be surprised by what you will discover. In a small, inconspicuous display cabinet, an object like no other can be found. Made from a brittle stone known as schist, it is similar in shape to a wheel or discus. This mysterious and to this day unexplained item has become known among particular circles as the tri-lobed disc. It has perplexed all those who have examined it, especially the select Egyptologists that have had the opportunity to study it at great length. Its discoverer is known as one of the most important Egyptologists of the 20th century, author of a classic volume on Egyptology, Archaic Egypt, that continues to be an important bibliographic reference of study even to this day. While carrying out excavations in 1936, Within the archaeological zone of Saqqara, Emery discovered the tomb of Prince Sabu. Among several utensils of varying function, the trilobe disc would be found. Emery's attention was immediately drawn to the object, initially defining it in his reports on the first dynasty tombs as, quote, a container in the form of schist bowl. Years later, he again commented on the subject with a word that perfectly summarized the reality of the situation indicating to the discomfort the object was causing, describing it as a kachibachi, a small hole that threatens to become bigger and bigger. It seems Emery, like many others within the same field, retained their success and notoriety by deliberately and publicly denying such artifacts any traction within the public domain. Denying us all a true understanding of Egyptian history, or at least a questioning of the currently upheld teachings. He finished his quotation by stating that a satisfactory explanation has not yet been obtained on the particular design of this object or indeed its construction. The accepted and predictably rigid view regarding the introduction of the wheel into ancient Egypt coincided with the invasion of the Hyksos at the end of the Medium Empire in 1640 BC. This date being over a thousand years after the disc's construction. Egyptologist Cyril Alred reached the conclusion that the object was, without a doubt, a copy of a previously much older metallic object. A detail next to the orifice in the center also made him suspect that this object was only a small part of a more complex mechanism and that it was saved thanks to a stone reproduction for unknown reasons made by an artist with unknown tools and the fact that it demonstrates such a complex design at such a primitive time in ancient Egyptian history suggests its origins may have been far more unusual than modern tenants would have you believe. It is highly possible that this artifact is a fragment of one's highly advanced technologies which have subsequently been lost over the millennia. Regardless of hypothesis, its true function, history, or indeed construction, its reason for existence remains a mystery to this day. If you enjoy our content, if you think our battle worthy, 
please help us to continue our voyage of discovery in unraveling the mysteries of history. Links to donate can be found within the description. Without you, we cannot survive. Thank you.